Welcome. Welcome everyone to TV Toastmasters Thursday, September 6th. We are meeting here at 7850 Five Mile Road the first Thursday of every month downstairs in the TV studio and then upstairs uh, the third Saturday of every month at 10 a.m. 7850 Five Mile Road and we welcome you. It is put on by Anderson Community Center. They welcome us here, and so I'm super excited to be here. And we have a great lineup for our meeting today. I am both the president today, acting as president today, and also the Toastmaster. So I would like to kick it off for our grammarian, and she's going, Suzanne Whitrock, and she's going to come up and explain the word of the day and what it means to be a grammarian. All right. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. All right. Good evening, guests and fellow Toastmasters. Our word of today is circumference. It's not Madam Conference and Sir <laughs> Conference. It is circumference. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, a t I'm helping in a classroom, and we were learning about the planets, and so that's why circumference. It is when you measure so a circle around the circle outside measurement. Circumference, the word of the day. And I'm also going to be listening to all the ahs and ohs and ums and so's and, 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 and. So, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Now I would like to welcome Phil Barth. And Phil Barth is one of the top speakers across the world. He just competed in the international speech contest. And if he wants to talk about that, he can. He's very humble, but for the moment, he's going to be our master of table topics. Please welcome Phil Barth. Thank you. We might talk about that later, the conference. Table topics is where we get to practice our impromptu speaking. So when you're in the elevator and the boss's boss's boss jumps in and knows that you're working on Project X and gives you the question, How's Project X going? You can quickly and intelligently answer because you've practiced in table topics. Or the same person asks you something completely off the wall. Again, like table topics, you will have a one to two minute answer ready to go. We ask that you attempt to speak for the entire one minute. You will see a green light come up at one minute, a yellow light at one and a half minutes, and should you go that long, a red light at two minutes. With that, I'm going to go to my go-to source for table topics, the internet. I will ask the question and either ask for a volunteer or volunteer someone. Our first question today, what would you do, what would you do differently if you knew nobody would judge you? Anybody, any takers on that? Any takers? I'm going to... Well, I, I told her we'd give her one to one to watch. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call on Suzanne. Suzanne, what would you do differently if you knew no one would judge you? Thank you. I would become a movie star. <laughs> I would go on Broadway and I would be up on stage and be a try to be a um, an actor. I would also write a book and give speeches about it. I would hold workshops about very interesting topics. I would go dancing more. And if I knew that I'm not going to be judged, I would probably also hmm, do what? Gotta think about that. I bet you tonight when I'm lying in bed I'll remember I will remember why what is it that I really want to do? <laughs> so I would also try to fly a plane, but that's more of fear than fear of being judged. It's more like fear. So that's what I would do if I think I would not be judged by anybody. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. See, that wasn't so bad. You made it over a minute. Which brings us to our next question. 
When was the last time you tried something new, and what was it? I'll do that. All right, come on up. When was This is a really good question for me. When did I do something new? I just wrote a book. I used to think I couldn't write, but I can write because I wrote a book. It went up on the internet in um, like June, and it is now downloadable. September 2nd it went downloadable, so you can buy this book. It's called The Spiritual Seeker's Guide, Five Steps to a life bursting with joy. So, I mean, I didn't think I could do it, but I knew that I needed to try to be an author because I need to have credibility, and they told me this is the best way to have credibility. So I did it. Now, to me, I'm credible, and maybe to the whole world I am because now I have a book that you can download if you want to Learn how to live a life bursting with joy, only five steps, and I'll give you a free example of what to do for each of the steps. So, do you want to have a life bursting with joy? You know how to do it. Yay! <laughs> Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have time for one more? Sure. Here's a good one. What does your joy look like today? What does your joy look like today? Dave, what does your joy look like today? And I will time you. What does my joy look like today? Well, it looks a lot better than it did a year ago. I've, um, as I told you earlier, when I first came here, I was going to speak about childhood trauma, and I've made some headway in that, and I've uh, got about half of my story written, and it's, right now it's like 10 pages, and that, that's 42 minutes and just speaking time. So by the time I get finished, I could probably have 20 to 25 pages, and I know when I'm going to do a speech here, and I'm going to have to really nitpick it and, and, and pluck it and all that to get it down into the, the correct time frame. So I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Those were some very good answers. Shout out to the internet for providing me with those questions. Would you like one more? Well, I only have 365 on the list. 37 seconds. <laughs> Wow, the you, no, you, no, you, no, you, no, you, no, you, no, you. It's the ping pong system. Hey, here's a good one. Number 35, <laughs> since those two are kind of at war over this, what is important enough to go to war over? <laughs> well, it looks like Alexander's doing the time, so congratulations, Veronica. What is important enough to go to war over, besides who gets the next table topic? <laughs> I believe war should be a last resort. Negotiation, understanding, and prescience, thinking ahead to try to avoid it 10 steps before we even get there. Sometimes behavior is aggressive and we lose our friends in the international community, our allies, the people who will stand with us. And we ourselves become weaker and a target. I love history. I love listening to audiobooks, biogra biogra biographies. I like to know the circumference of a story. <laughs> I like to know why World War II happened and why the Holocaust happened. And to some extent, what are the warning signs of how we were to prevent something like that again in the future? I have now run out of time, and I welcome back Mr. Table Topics Master, Phil Barth. Very good. Kind of had a circumference of questions there. 
<laughs> and I will turn it now over to our president and Toastmaster Veronica. Welcome back. Now we go into our speech section of the meeting, and I will be giving the first speech, which is why I wanted Alexander to do table topics. <laughs> I don't want this to be the Veronica show, but, but there it is. We've got other people in the meeting as well. I will be giving the icebreaker speech on the new Pathways project. Is that four to six? It is four to six. Thank you. And the path that I have chosen is coaching. And I am a budding coach. I know almost nothing about coaching. So my icebreaker begins here. When I was a kid, youngest of six in an Irish Catholic family, my mother showed us a newspaper clipping of a castle in Ireland that happened to be an O'Mahony castle, or Mahoney as we say it today. She told us that this castle was taken by the English ages and ages and ages and ages ago. And my sister Lucy said, if they hadn't taken that castle, I would be a princess. And I looked at her and I said, Lucy, you'll always be a princess. <laughs> I love my sister. But sometimes this, sometimes we all get stuck. This was an example of getting stuck. Now, admittedly, she was probably seven years old. But sometimes we get stuck in ancient history and ancient grudges that we really don't have to go war over. Right? We don't have to fight that fight. We can go forward instead of carrying on that baggage of everything that happened to our parents or our parents or our parents, 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 parents. So I will say, I'm not a fan of labels. I did get a chance to fly a plane. And the day I took my flying lesson was one of the windiest ones in Cincinnati ever. No one would go up with the pilot except for myself, one of those Groupons. And I went up. I went up. I went up. And the plane went this way, and the plane went that way, and the plane went this way. And I have to tell you, I was praying to everybody. I didn't care what religion or nationality, if I could think of a name, I was praying to it. So that said, w they say there are no agnostics in a foxhole. Well, there are no agnostics in a plane that you're trying to just please get me safely landed. I was a kid. Everybody was a kid. But I was a kid that was bullied. Being Irish Catholic with divorced parents in a Catholic school, I was bullied. I also had terrible acne before anybody else had it. I started at 10 with terrible acne because I love sugar. I blame it all on the candy. Right? Terrible acne. So I was really terribly bullied. And I won't go into the details. But I will say that sort of victim mentality has carried forward, sadly, to my adult life. And what I do very cautiously is I will listen to people, even if they're yelling even if they're upset, even if they're bullies. Because what I'm trying to find out is what is true, where is their value, what can I learn from this? But I still get buffeted by this emotion because I'm sensitive. I've learned three things that are very helpful about being bullied that may help somebody in the audience. One, imagine that this adult who's yelling at you is really a seven-year-old boy who's been abused. I could feel compassion for a seven-year-old boy who's been abused. Very hard for me to be compassionate to a 50-year-old man who's breathing down my neck. Right? That's number one. Number two, be the thin air. Just let it blow through you. 
You don't even have to let it stick. Let go of the ego. Just imagine you're on the mountainside and those are the winds blowing through. And the third is feel gratitude. Feel gratitude for being here, in my case, for having a job, a great house, living in a wonderful country where I have freedom as a female, other countries I might not have. That flight, getting in that plane, and in my mind, almost dying, mm -hmm. made me very much aware of what I have and how much I really don't want to lose. The whole circumference of my life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We now, as Toastmaster, we now have a choice. Oh, one minute of silence, please, for the evaluator to evaluate the speaker. Perfect. All right. We now have the opportunity to have three speeches today. Our second speaker, is she ready? I'm ready. Super. Our second speaker today is Angel... Lure Lurman. Lurman, forgive me. Angel Lurman is going to be speaking from the Speaking to Inform Advanced Manual. Her speech is five to seven minutes, and the title of her speech is What You Need to Know. What You Need to Know, Angel Lurman. Please welcome. Thank you, for I do apologize, Veronica, but there was a last minute change. And the speech is not from that manual, it's from the storytelling manual. My, my mistake, and it's four to six minutes. <clears throat> it, but the title was correct, what you need to know. Throughout my life, there's been someone around me to tell me exactly what I need to know. What you need to know, and then they drop some infinite wisdom, something that they feel is the key to success in everything else. Some of that advice goes a long way, and it's been very helpful. Like, always wear your seatbelt. Don't smoke in bed. Don't forget clean underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of the advice has been that profound. <laughs> Some of it's been kind of out there, but you learn what to listen to and what not to. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Toastmasters, it all starts really innocently. Our parents begin to teach us. They tell us what we need to know. They tell us what we need to know about how to walk. Eventually, we walk. They tell us what we need to know to talk. And if you're like my granddaughter, you start and never stop cute, but she never stops. <laughs> they teach you how to go to the potty. Maybe they teach you how to use a potty chart, like this one. <laughs> but it's all very innocent. Once our parents are through with us and we begin school, our teachers get in on the action. I think this is the fun part for them. Now they get to tell me what I need to know. I need to know that my science fair project is due Friday. I need to know that we're having spelling tests on Friday. I need to know all these dates in history that for some reason all jumble together, 1492, 1412, they all blend together, but I need to know them. Once you get through school, you graduate, you're out in the real world, you're an adult, right? You get to do what you want now. You know what you need to know. No, now it's your boss's turn to tell you what you need to know. Mm. <laughs> Dave, you need to know that your project is due Friday. No extensions. Phil, you need to know that you get paid every other Friday. No raises. And Veronica, you need to know that your boss is cutting your budget in half this year. All these things we need to know. It's a lot of information. I'm 47 years old. 
So I've had to know a lot of things. I've had time to reflect on all this wisdom that's been imparted to me. And I've come to this conclusion. Out of all the advice I've been given, and everything that I now know, there's really only one thing, only one thing that I really need to know. I need to know how to communicate. If you can't communicate, you can't do anything else. Communication is the key to everything else. That was the infinite wisdom they were looking for. If I can communicate, I can start a new conversation with someone I've never known. I can expand my horizons, try new things, open new opportunities, and go wherever I want to go. Public speaking is the number one fear. It ranks even higher than the fear of death. I don't know about you, but I, I fear death a lot. <laughs> I'd much rather get up here and talk to you than to die. Public speaking is scary, but with practice, it doesn't have to be. So in my infinite wisdom, I invite you all to bring a guest to your next meeting and impart your infinite wisdom of public speaking to them. And I would love to join you. Thank you, Madam President. And I request the timer give us one minute of silence for the evaluator to evaluate Angel. Lord. Okay, we're back. Well, it's interesting that Angel had mentioned the fear of death. I work downtown Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And today at Fifth Third Bank in Fountain Square, there was a shooter, an active shooter. And so, of course, everybody got a little bit nervous. It, it was taken care of at the loss of four lives, I believe, so far. No one in our building was affected. Fine. Thank you. Fine. Um, so I, I, uh, we won't have time for a minute of silence, but if you can, you know, take a moment to pray for the souls and, and uh, thank God for our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. We now have time for our third speaker of the evening. It's a bonus. Super. Phil is going, Phil Barth is going to be speaking. His speech is... Pants on fire. Pants on fire. Phil Barr. This is four to seven. Five to seven. All of you were gracious enough to listen to me practice my speech many times over the course of the summer before I went to Chicago. And in some of those practices, I made a couple of statements. One of them was on Facebook, if not said live, and that was, this is going to be my last speech contest. The other one I made several times was, I'm in it to win it. It's nice to influence the audience. It's nice to have that moment, but I want the big trophy. You may or may not have heard those, but let me start by saying, liar, liar, pants on fire. At the time when I said both of those statements, I really thought it was the truth. So the question is, when does a false statement actually become a lie? And to answer that question, we need to go back in time to the Thursday of the speech contest in Chicago. At this point, I've already met our, my fellow competitors on Wednesday. We've had our dress rehearsal. We're actually becoming friends, if not acquaintances for some, friends for hopefully life with others. And the speech contest got started. I drew position number 10 out of the 11 speakers, which is a nice position because you get to see what the competition looks like. You get to size them up. And as speaker three came up, this man had a very good connection with the audience. Everything he said, they were laughing. And so the first thing that's going through my head is, I'm in trouble. I'm going to have to do better. What, what can I do? And it's a really good idea, not, when you've been practicing a speech all summer long, to make a change after speaker number three when you're speaker number ten. But that is exactly what I did. About on speaker number four I said, 
I wonder if I change the opening. And, and if you saw me do the opening, I took off my jacket and I spread it down as a beach towel and I sat down on the beach. And so I'm thinking, what if I laid down on the beach? That would be funnier. But you can't just think that. You have to actually practice that. And you can't do that in the room because it distracts the speaker. So I had to make a plan to go out in the hall. <laughs> now, a semifinal speech contest is no different from area or any others. If you leave for a speech, you stay out for the entire speech. By the time I decided to do this, speaker five was up. I could not leave during speakers number eight or speaker number nine because I would be getting my microphone in speaker number nine and I would be out in the hall and I should be ready to get my microphone in speaker number eight. So I decided to leave during speaker number six. Speaker number six was Ramona Smith, who is now the current world champion of public speaking. So I missed her speech. And to, through the miracle of the internet, I have seen it since. And so what I did was I went out into the hall. And there were people out in the hall guarding the doors. And I figured, well, they've seen worse. So I proceeded to lay down on the floor and try my opening. I was like, well, what if I did like this? Well, now that'd be pretty cool. Well, what if I actually went like this? Well, that'd be really stupid. So I'm going back and forth, and I finally decided to settle on the opening, which involved me sitting down, talking about turning 50, and then dropping, saying, five decades, half a century. Now, I had to do it on this side because the Toastmaster or contest chair was right over there. So that, that enabled me to go, Mr. Contest Chair, which everybody in the audience liked, and then that enabled me to do what you may have heard me do when I got up before, which is, <clears throat> which is a very natural sound for me at my age when I get up. I practice that sound hundreds of times a day. Well, that worked. And it worked really well, and I got the audience involved, and we were having fun. Now, before I go to the audience, we now have to go backstage, because as speaker number nine is out there, I am getting mic'd up. And so I have to make sure that they put the the control unit on this side. If they put it on this side, it's going to be a real big scene when I lay on it. Put it on this side, and I'm getting mic'd up, and then I go back down onto the floor one last time, and people are looking at me like, okay, you're a speech competitor. We get it. You guys are odd. And I got mic'd up. And then before I went out on stage, I do the same thing that I try to do before every competition and should do before every speech, and certainly before every big competition, and that is... I looked out the curtain at the audience, and I said, I love you guys. And you're not going to believe what I'm about to do on the stage. You're going to love it, and we're going to have so much fun. And then I said what I heard Drew Barrymore says before every movie she makes, let's play. I did a little prayer, and by the time that minute was up, I was ready to run out on the stage and do the speech. I was excited. This is a good thing. And I did. And it worked. And the audience laughed when I wanted them to laugh. And even sometimes when I wasn't expecting them to laugh. And they actually gave me applause. And I, and I got off that stage and I said, I can't do any better. And that was for the best seven minutes of my year, probably. And I had so much fun. And when I sat back down, I thought, I watched the other speakers. And I thought, well, worst case, I'll pro I hope to finish second. Because I think I got all of them. I just don't know what happened while I was outside of the room. Well, now we all know what happened when I was outside of the room. And I was announced second, and I wasn't fine with it. I got to explore the rest of Chicago. The person who, I, you know, Ramona won, so I couldn't speak to that. Like, must have been good, and it was. I saw it. And I thought afterwards, well, I'm not really upset about it. That's odd, because the whole goal was to win the trophy. Why am I not upset? Later that day, as I was walking between the Marriott and the convention center, a man stopped me. He said, I saw your speech. Let me ask you something. He said, do you look at the judge's form before you speak? Or when you're planning your speech? I said, never. He said, well, do you think that might be why you lost? And I thought, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should have looked at the form. Maybe I should have constructed my speech more toward the form to check off all those boxes. And I thought, no, no, 
I don't want to do that. If I do something to make it perfect on the form in hopes of winning a trophy and I don't connect with the audience, that's not as good. So it turns out I was lying. I didn't want the trophy. I wanted to connect with the audience. Who knew? Who knew? The, as for the other lie, well, and this goes back to what Angel said, I think a big lie is people are, the number one fear is public speaking. The number one fear is not public speaking, it's making a fool of yourself. It just so happens that public speaking is a great way to do it. All right, so my, what's my number one thing? I want to connect with audiences. Well, why would I throw out a speech contest as an option? It's not the only way, but it's a wonderful way to do it. So what I learned in Chicago was a couple things about myself. Both two statements turned out to be a lie, but I'm a much smarter person, hopefully, as a result, because I want to connect with audiences, and that's the number one thing, and any way I can do that, including more speech contests, is exactly what I want to do. Thank you. I jumped up so quick there wasn't much time for applause. That is an international contestant right there. One minute of silence, please. We now enter into the second, third half, third half. <laughs> it's kind of like, anyway, third half that, that <laughs> sorry, it reminds me of a TV, what is it? I'm so sorry. Car talk, right? Anyway, the third half of the show. So the third half of the show is the evaluation portion of the show. The very first part of the show is the table topics. So the impromptu speaking and then there's the speech. So that's it. The person who's going to be introducing this section is Phil Barth. He is the general, general evaluator for the meeting. Please welcome Phil Barth. Let's get right into it. By the way, a smarter speaker might have brought his bottle of water today so he wasn't sitting here with duck. So forgive me for having a dry mouth as I introduce our evaluators tonight. Our first evaluator, evaluating speech one, Veronica's icebreaker, will be Suzanne, Suzanne Wittrock. Welcome, Suzanne. So I am uh, evaluating Veronica's speech for icebreaker. I really like that you had like three little stories inside the big story. The um, part with the castle in Ireland, the flying, and the story about bullying. And with each one you had a little something to tell us about. That, um, especially with the bullying, I like that you gave us something to think about, you know, to in the future maybe to look at things a little bit different. So that was nice. Uh, the only thing I would almost wish that you would have ha talked a little bit more about yourself. Like you would say, when, when you started out with the castle in Ireland, I'm like, oh, I want to hear more about the childhood and, and all these stories with, you probably have so many, you know, from, from the Ireland past. <laughs> and and with the bowling, yeah, it's um, you. You kind of just flew over that real quickly. You know, I almost wish you would have gotten a little more into it, like how it. Maybe a, a little example of what happened with you. You know how you got bullied. You always have really great eye contact, and your story. I mean, usually your speech are always really great. I always look forward to them, and. That's really all I have to say about that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Oh, sorry. sorry, sorry. <laughs> That's my fault. I was back there taking notes as general evaluator, <laughs> trying to do the dual role here. Our second evaluator will be Veronica Sanford. She will evaluate Angel's speech. So please welcome up Veronica. Angel, thank you so much for coming tonight. I, I, Angel is our district area. area director, 
And so she holds a position that helps us as a coach, as a club coach, and also in this particular case, also giving us a wonderful speech, what you need to know. So thank you for that. The weather is terrible tonight. It's the traffic was horrible and it is hard to recover, you know, especially when, you know, we're running late or it's hectic or, you know, it's just crazy. Um, and of course, actually making a phone call while you're driving is really tough. Um, searching for a phone number. So it's, I, I thank you so much for coming here and being brave to recover enough to give a speech. So that said, I love that you gave a plug for Toastmasters. I think it's really important to, uh, to educate people how important communication is. If you're, if you're passionate about anything, anything, it's very hard to do that in a vacuum with just yourself. It really, to get some wings underneath you, whether or not you're writing a book or in an international speech contest or on the radio or television or, or communicating just one-on-one, -on -one, the effectiveness of your communication can really help you become more effective. Number two, I liked it when you said, communicate. It was very good. It was vocal variety. I also like the fact that you got away from the lectern. Now, I'm uh, not as tall as some people are. <laughs> And I do think that, in a way, I hide behind the lectern sometimes. So I thought you were uh, courageous, in a way, to get behind the, you know, get away from lectern. You could also have pushed it aside, you know, a dramatic gesture. But, uh, I, I believe that you, I, oh, I could have done that when I said bullying, right? <laughs> Boom, kicked it. I do believe that you have a quiet voice. And I would, uh, sometimes you can't, yell it may not be your nature but wouldn't it have been fun if at one point or another you said Phew! or <coughs> or some funny noise right that would have indicated which i hear is a great stress re releaser by the way so that ends my evaluation for angel i once again i'm so grateful for you to coming and i did i thought it was very educational speech thank you very much don't go away our next evaluator will be our last evaluator, so <laughs> please welcome back up Suzanne to evaluate my speech. <laughs> I get to be Suzanne for the day. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Veronica. <laughs> you have some. <laughs> you don't want to be me. I, all right, let, let me quickly explain where that happened. I wrote down Veronica when you were, or I wrote down Suzanne when you were evaluating Suzanne's speech, and I instantly switched your names. I apologize. <laughs> Okay, right. Veronica will now evaluate my speech. <laughs> we have a good time here. We really do. We really do. So that said, all right, so Phil's an accomplished speaker, right? He, uh, depending upon how you look at it, he came in number two worldwide, right? And 30,000 people competed and I don't know, 130 countries, I don't know how many countries competed. A large number of countries competed. So some of the things to look for that we re generally recommend are his gestures, right? He made dramatic gestures. He could have been speaking, you know, he didn't, you know, he didn't go 100 miles one way or another, 100 feet one way or another like he would on a big stage, but he did, he did use his gestures, etc. He made good contact with the camera. He made good contact with all of us. And he had a great sense of humor. He makes us laugh, right? There's one point that I thought that you might consider in the future because while your volume goes up and down, it kind of goes up and down in the same register. I didn't hear a shout. I didn't hear a whisper, mm -hmm. right? So you could have gone that way. And hopefully I didn't bother anybody else in the other TV studio over there. <laughs> I, I, I thought the point that you made, now one of the things about evaluating speeches is we don't necessarily need to evaluate the content except, unless it's exceptional. The fact that you thought what you gave us was your preparation to, to compete in front of 2,000, 3,000 people? I, the finals were 2,000, it was about a third of that. Okay. 500. Very large group of people and also one okay. that's going to be displayed to people who are generally not critical in a negative way but analyze your speech in a very critical way he said he thought to himself I love you guys 
He thought, I, let's play, let's have fun. He gave us a lot of advice to relieve tension. One of the things that I heard once is that people will never remember how you, what you said. They will remember how you made them feel. And people can know if you think poorly of them or if you love them or if you want to have fun, right? And that's really so important is how, what did they leave with? And, and that's one of the things that helps me get through Toastmasters. I would like to welcome back Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you. I will now call up Suzanne for real this time and as she will go through the circumference of evaluation <laughs> on our grammarian report. Oh, got the wrong people, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, the word of the day was circumference and I have heard it Let's see, twice from Phil, twice from Veronica. I guess that circumference is this part of the <laughs> talk. <laughs> when it came to so and ahs and ums, I noticed at least one for myself that was a so. Marilyn had an ah and a couple of so's in there. Dave was pretty cool, nothing to complain about. <laughs> And um, nothing with Phil, Veronica, or Angel. You guys are all so perfect when you speak. You must have done this a few times before. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Excellent. Good work. Yeah. <laughs> Dave will now come up and give us our timer report. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. Heard a timer report for tonight on the table topics is a one to two minute speech. And Suzanne, you came in at one minute and one at 11 seconds. Marilyn, you came in at one minute and 15 seconds. And I fell short. I come in at 37 seconds, so I went and uh, I got the gong show. <laughs> uh, and uh, Veronica, she came in at one minute and 14 seconds. Speaker number one was Veronica, and her speech was four to six minutes, and she went four minutes and 41 seconds. Speaker two was Angel, and her speech was four to six minutes, and she came in at four minutes and 30 seconds. Speaker three was Phil. His speech was five to seven minutes, and he came in at 7.54, so he was over by 24 seconds. And evaluator number one was Suzanne. And these, uh, and this was a two to three minute for the evaluators. And she was a minute and 35 seconds, so she was under 25 seconds. Veronica was uh, evaluator number two. She was two minutes and 34 seconds. And evaluator number three was Veronica. <laughs> and she came in at two minutes and 20 seconds. And that's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, I get to evaluate the rest of the meeting, those that have not yet been evaluated. So the speakers have been evaluated. I will now evaluate the evaluators and others. Let's start with the table topics. Marilyn, you did a great job coming up on your first time. You, it wasn't just what you said, it was how you said it. You could tell that you were very passionate about that. And you could watch this with the volume off and still see the passion in what you projected. I thought that was very good. Suzanne, you were over one minute, and I liked, you had a memorable line in there on, I would dance more. So I thought that, was, that was an awesome line, awesome line. Dave, I think you could have gone a little longer. You, you seemed like you had comfort with it. You stopped at 37 seconds. So. And Veronica, you had a tough question, and I thought you did a great job handling it. And, and I don't know if you won the war with Alexander or lost the war, <laughs> but in either case, you did a great job handling it. The evaluation, Suzanne, your evaluation of Veronica, you used the classic sandwich method. I thought you did it quite well. I always like feedback when it's how it impacted you, the audience member, because you said, I would have liked to have heard more. 
And, and that's not on the standard classic feedback form, but that's very valuable feedback for the person who's speaking because they, they want to influence the audience. And you said, look, I would have liked to have heard more about the castle. I would have liked to have heard more about that. I always like getting that. So that was an outstanding job. Veronica, I like that you showed, and you were evaluating Angel's speech first. You showed how applicable her speech was to us and how it, as you know, communicators, we need this information. I like that. And then you gave her some good feedback on the voice and, some, and a suggestion for improvement. Always like that. And then you gave me some feedback in the suggestion for a different register, which that's, that's a good good suggestion, especially in a contest speech and something I wrote down and will keep for future reference. I believe that. I have evaluated everybody. The overall meeting, we got started late, and I think we're going to go a little late, but that's because I stuck my hand up and said, I'll be the third speaker. So, good job, everybody. I'm going to turn it back over to our Toastmaster. Thank you. Because I am both the Toastmaster and the standing in for the president today, I will close with saying thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to the TV audience. Once again, we are at 7850 Five Mile Road in Anderson Community Center. It is in Cincinnati, but it is in Anderson Township. We're downstairs on the first Thursday of the month at 6 o'clock, although we do tend to start a little bit late, 20 minutes sometimes, because of the uh, TV setup. And then also on the third Saturday, again, we usually start at 10.15. We meet at 10 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning, of course, upstairs to meet and mingle. Please do come. It is free anytime, as often as you would like. If you do want to become a member and start giving speeches, then you register to become a member, and we can talk to you about that. So thank you again.